It's not just epic this time, you guys. It's also easy. Oh. Hey guys, Kira here from 50 Shades of Mom, tips for all shades of a mom life. And in today's video, I have another episode of Epic Meal Prep, but this time you guys, it's super easy. I'm gonna share with you guys what we do as our staples. We have some things that we do weekly, some things bi-weekly, and then some things monthly, depending on what's on the menu or what kind of groceries we've picked up at the stores. But this is pretty much what I would call back to basics. This is something that you can just do to set yourself up for a week or a month of success. And with everything going on in our house, meal prep is always key for making making things super easy for us to go about our everyday life when we're not stressing over constantly prepping food. And these are things that I don't do in one whole day. Whenever I have a free moment or an extra time, I'll just go ahead and meal prep something that I know is going to work for us moving forward. So I'm gonna take you down to my counter in the kitchen and we have so many good things planned. We're gonna do a rotisserie chicken. We're gonna make our own pickled vegetables. We're gonna mix up some dressing. We're going to make some boiled eggs in our instant pot. We're going to do some veggies and get them all cleaned up and ready to go. We're going to make homemade croutons. So lots of things on the agenda. And again, you guys, they are all super easy. And I guess the easiest of them all is cleaning my produce. I don't think I ever cleaned my produce as much until I started YouTube and I learned how truly important it is. And then now what I see is left in the bowl when I am done cleaning is mind blowing. So I have my bowl right here and this is just a few things I had picked up at the store. Literally, we do produce every single week you guys because every single week I get produce so you guys don't need to see an entire video of me cleaning every single thing all of the time but I literally do it with ice cold water I like to use the filtered water in like my Brita and I just throw it into a bowl with whatever fruit that I'm using I throw in probably a couple of tablespoons of distilled white vinegar I let them sit I swish it around and then I drain them and once they get a good drip dry sometimes I'll use a paper towel or another towel just to make sure they're as dry as possible and then I'll throw them inside of a container. Now here for the blackberries and for these raspberries you'll see that I have the containers from the Dollar Tree which I've since all gotten rid of. I'll link when I cleaned out my whole Tupperware cabinet and shared with you guys exactly how I loaded in my new Brilliance containers. I am absolutely in love with them. They are in the end clip of this video but I love them. Now I also like these. These are the push top ox containers those work really really well as well but this is just pretty standard for us to every single time we get some kind of fruit or veggie in the house just to fill our bowls with water throw our fruit and veggies in there and then clean them look at all the dirt and seeds and like stuff that was left over from the strawberries so always a super important these are even plums that I just have air drying right here that I was gonna throw inside of a fruit bowl that I went and cleaned those all off. Grapes are always crucial in our house for cleaning. So produce is always a weekly staple. Now next is using my food saver. I am in love with this food saver, you guys. It is linked in my Amazon store below if you guys want to check it out, especially that one. For when I'm shopping at bulk stores like Sam's and Costco and I want to break down my meat. So I have chicken breasts in here. I have ground beef. I have these roast beefs that needed to be packed. I had steaks in here. And again, I absolutely swear by this food saver and only this particular brand for a specific reasons. Food saver has many different models, but it's this one that I love. So I always start off by wiping it down just because I keep it in the cabinets that are located up above my stove. So sadly, any kind of grease or anything that I'm using to cook on the stove ends up kind of making it yucky and I'm all about keeping things clean when it comes to cross contamination. So once it's cleaned, you're going to pop the lever down and you'll see that it's blinking red and when it stops blinking red, it means it's heat sealed the bottom of the bag. And so now you're just going to pull your bag to your desired length and it has a little lever across the bottom and you're just going to slide that across and it ends up just cutting your bag. So why I say that I'm obsessed with cross contamination 
contamination is because you're always dealing with meat in this particular situation. I mean, obviously you can go ahead and use a food saver to use anything. I mean, I used to do it with my bagels when I brought bagels home from Long Island, but meat trips me out. So I am forever, I load in some meat and then I go wash my hands, which is what I just did. And then I come back with some kind of antibacterial towel and wipe down the whole surface area. And then when I'm done, I'll use a Clorox wipe and wipe all of these packages before I go ahead and put them in the freezer. Because again, I'm all about like not wanting to get germs or bacteria or anything like that. So right now I'm doing those roast beefs and breaking them apart. There was two in the package. And so this is the reason why I love this one. It has a dry and moist setting. So for dry, it knows that it doesn't really have any give. So once it realizes that it's airtight, then it'll shut off. But for the moist, it knows that you can kind of squish it and it'll keep going. So it knows to judge how to seal it right. And then it'll start to blink red and then it'll seal and then it'll pop open on its own and then you're good to go and they have all the little white strips down the side for you to write on which i love uh, the other roast beef i did not put in the food saver i actually put it in a bowl with a little bit of broth and some onion soup mix and just marinated it because we were going to have it later on in the week now, one step to help with contamination is I'll go ahead and make a couple of bags until I have a pile of them. This way I don't have to keep stopping and washing my hands and cutting all of the different bags because once you get started, now your hands are in meat. So I took this big tray of ground beef and I made little slits and cuts into it. And then I just took chunks out until I got what I fi figured would be the desired amount for my family. And then I just go ahead and repeat the process and do all of that until all of my ground beef or my meats are done. Now, I absolutely love this because if you're using any kind of deep freezer to store your meat, it does not take long for things to get freezer burned. And it also allows me to position things properly. So if you noticed, I was just flattening them out. So I flatten them out a little bit before I stick it in the saver and then I flatten it out again. So it's easily stackable, which makes things easier and then once I'm done there I am again with some antibacterial spray and some paper towels just making sure you're wiping down all of your surfaces again so that there's no cross contamination but you can see everything that I did I left some ground beef out for that night's dinner and then I got four packages of ground beef two steaks a one roast beef in the container one roast beef that was food saved and then a whole bunch of chicken now those chicken you can see ended up in those big again gallon size bags but this is old food prep you see that that says September 1st you guys yeah these videos are always super hard for me to get out so if you've watched my grocery hauls you've seen I've since restocked on my food saver bags so no need to use my ziplocs anymore now we're back to food saver bags but again you guys I swear by that food saver and I love the fact that that model has that moist setting so that's the one that's listed in my Amazon store all right, you guys, now we're on to croutons, and this is a very sensitive subject for me, and you will see why. So I absolutely love using the baguette from Trader Joe's. This makes the best croutons, and I cut it in half this time. Usually I make the whole one, but I went to the Cheesecake Factory to take my girlfriend out for her birthday, and I tried their brown bread for the first time, and it was amazing, and it was $2 a loaf. So I bought one when I was leaving, and I cut them both in half, and I figured they'd be great to cut them and do like white and brown croutons. So I have a whole bunch of garlic cut up here on a little cutting board, along with some bacon grease, and then I have some regular olive oil and some butter. I'm pretty much basically going to make a really delicious garlicky fatty mixture that you're going to mix these bread cubes in that you're going to cut and then roast in the oven to make croutons. So I start off by putting a saucepan onto the stove and I threw in about two and a half tablespoons of butter and then I would probably say a little less than a quarter cup of olive oil. And then while that's heating up, we're going to start cutting our bread. So I just cut the half of the baguette into strips and then smaller strips and then come back and cube them. I do not like to do really super small strips because you'll see how easily these things can over toast. So if you do a larger crouton, it just gives you a better base to end up with a really nice hearty crispy crouton instead of little tiny burnt up pieces. So once we cut up 
a majority of this bread, you can tell that our mixture was ready because the butter was starting to sizzle with the oil. So I went ahead and threw my garlic in, but you guys, you have to babysit this and I cannot multitask sometimes and so my garlic burned it always does because I'm always trying to do a million things because now I'm back to cutting my bread and I want all my bread to be finished before I pulled it from the stove which was silly because it wasn't ready like it I should have pulled it ahead of time but anyways go ahead and cube the rest of your bread if you can do that ahead of time before you make your mixture that would be smart but once you have all of your bread all cubed up you're just going to go ahead and throw it into a bowl and then by now longer way longer too long your mixture should be ready on the stove for you to pull off and pour into your bread you can see that those pieces are a little extra dark they didn't taste burnt but i'm very sensitive when it comes to garlic i love a really delicious roasted garlic so if it's too burnt i'm not about that life but i didn't even need all of that bacon grease i just threw in like two tablespoons and then that was more than enough to give all the bread a good coating but i did throw it on the pan that i used to make a bacon so it was already greased and it had a little bit of that extra flavor already in the pan and so once i just got it all set up and ready to go i just went ahead and threw it in an oven for 400 degrees now what i learned is that these brown pieces they just toast up way faster than the white so i went ahead and put it in the oven and then did what i always do and i got involved in something else and then i ended up with burnt pieces and i was so sad like some of these pieces are black you guys and that made me really upset because you can see that the white pieces are maybe just a tad bit overdone but for the most part that's a really nice hearty crispy crouton but the brown ones were way overdone like i had to cut the burnt pieces off in some parts and then for the rest of the time like it was okay but i needed redemption because i was so upset that i filmed this to share with you guys and then i burnt it but i burned everything so i'm sure you guys are used to it by now but i loaded that into my oxo container and then this is a couple of weeks later i remade it because i had to share with you guys that i can do it again but I burnt it again. And you can see this time that the white pieces are way lighter than they were before. And those brown pieces are still darker. So if I do it like this again, next time, I'm gonna have to cook the white and the brown separately and then integrate them together later so I can watch them because clearly they couldn't cook together. But it is a super easy crouton recipe, you guys. And nothing is better than homemade croutons. So now we're on to a dessert. And this is the Trader Joe's triple chocolate cookie mix. I always have tons of cookie mixes or brownie mixes or something like that on hand and I try and make one of these at least once a week instead of always buying tons of stuff on the outside so this recipe is super easy it's the mix with butter and egg so you stick one tablespoon of butter into a ramekin and stick it into the microwave until it's melted and then you're going to go ahead and throw your melted butter into a bowl and then you're going to add your full egg, your white and yolk together. And I only say that because some of their cookie mixes call for just a yolk or just a white. But you're going to throw the whole egg in and then mix the butter and the egg together. And then you're going to go ahead and add your mix and mix. It's that simple. Now, I have mentioned every single time I've shared myself using one of these mixes that if you find it at Trader Joe's, I highly recommend it. It is three separate cookie mixes for $5. They are super, super worth it. It does take a little bit of work. You need to put a little elbow grease in to stir those wet ingredients because it's not a whole lot of wet in a big pile of dry so it does take a little bit to integrate everything together but once you do you can see that it's easy easy to the point where you can just roll them in little one inch balls and then you put them on a cookie sheet it says you'll get 12 to 14 cookies and i get 14 which works out perfect it's a couple of days of desserts or lunchtime snacks or something for my kids they cook up so perfectly look at that you guys i mean absolutely dynamite it tastes like like devil's food cake i cannot explain it but warm out of the oven oh my gosh they're so gooey and chewy and yummy keep an eye out for these mixes if you have a trader joe's 
All right, now we're on to ranch dressing, and I share this all the time, but you guys always ask me for my recipe when you see it other times, and it is super, super easy. So I always start off with a two-quart pitcher, and then I just throw in some buttermilk till the pitcher is filled about halfway. So one quart of buttermilk, and I use the 1% low fat if you're looking to cut back on the fat content, and then I add in mayo until it's almost to the top of the container. So it's very easy to be able to see how much mayo you need because it's to the top and then I add in a half cup of ranch dressing mix this is the last of the hidden valley and then I'm moving on to the McCormick which you guys asked to see how that was so I'll let you guys know next time but then I added in one tablespoon of garlic powder and then I give it a good stir and I can usually tell by the consistency that I need just a little bit of mayo so I did a little bit more mayo one tablespoon another tablespoon of garlic powder so that's two total and then a whole bunch of cracked black pepper and then I'll give it another mix and then once I know that I'm not going to spray powder and stuff everywhere I come back with my whisk so you can eliminate all those clumps and get a nice creamy dressing now I usually get this all over the place which I did of course nothing new so I did come back with a paper towel and clean everything up before I stuck the lid on but my family is obsessed with ranch dressing if I do not have a picture of this in the refrigerator they are devastated but this picture lasts us about three weeks or so and it holds like it, they, it doesn't go bad and it's like the perfect pourable consistency my kids love it with all of their veggies and stuff and it just it's like I said it's a house staple all right, so we're gonna do a rotisserie chicken and I have an entire video on how I actually tie this chicken up and get it to where it's set on the rod to go into the rotisserie. And I also have an entire video on how the Kasori toaster oven and rotisserie and air fryer works. I always say this, it's not a sponsored video. I just, they sent it to me a long time ago and I'm obsessed and I love it. And I love that I can make a rotisserie chicken right in my house for free, but I have shown how to do it in more detail. I just don't like to show that in every meal prep video. So I'll link it up above so you guys can see the whole tour and exactly a step-by-step -step process on how I tie the chicken up. But basically I just tie it everywhere. It's legs, it's arms, it's, it's wings to its body and you put it on a rod and then it just connects into that little hole on one side and then it sits on a spinning wheel on the other side. Now, excuse my toaster oven, it's super dirty right now, but when you cook a rotisserie chicken, it spits fat all over that thing and it definitely gets messy. So when I know I, it needs a cleaning is when I stick a rotisserie chicken in there. This way, once it's all done, I'll give it a good wipe down afterwards. But it is super easy, you guys. You just stick that rod, like I said, in the hole and it goes on to the spinning wheel and it's that simple as long as you keep that bird good and secure to the rod so none of its wings or legs fall down while it's turning this thing is amazing and so there's all different settings everything from bake pizza bagel dehydrate air fry and then of course the rotisserie setting and so I always leave it on 400 degrees and I usually cook for an hour and 20 minutes because I don't put a bird in more than five pounds or it's really hard for that rod to turn but that's it you guys it doesn't take too long and then before you know it this beautiful chicken comes out and so I usually use this for all different kinds of things you can serve this for your family for dinner just as a regular rotisserie chicken a lot of the times I pull it apart and I'll make things like chicken salad or I'll just keep the regular chicken on hand for things like quesadillas or salads. In this particular case, I ended up using it to make broth. And then I used all the chicken and mixed it with barbecue sauce and put it on King's Hawaiian rolls with melted provolone. And we had that for a football Sunday, which was amazing. But I actually love this purpose more than anything else. Because once I'm done with the chicken, I just go ahead and stick all the bones in a pot of boiling water. And I add all of my veggie scraps, you guys. I just add my celery, my carrots, my onion scrap. Whenever I'm cooking and using veggies, I just don't throw away the scraps and I freeze them. And then whenever I have a carcass to use, I just go ahead and throw the carcass in the pot with some water and then all of my frozen veggie scraps and a little bit of salt and pepper. And I just let that baby stew down. And then I end up with a little bit of extra chicken and then tons of broth. So I'll put whatever little chicken falls off the bone 
bone plus the broth into some Tupperware into the freezer and poof, I won't need to buy broth for a month. All right, now we're on to pickling some veggies for Jake. If you guys know my kid, he's absolutely obsessed with any kind of pickled vegetable. And I actually learned something neat. Don't throw away your pickle juice. The next time you finish off your favorite jar of pickles, just go ahead and save the jar with all of its juices and all the flavorings right inside. And then you're just gonna go ahead and reuse it. So I have this one from Boar's Head that's amazing. You can even see the little pieces of garlic in there. There's dill in there. I did end up pouring a little bit of that out and I kind of do a refresher topper. So on here is one cup of vinegar and one cup of water and one tablespoon of sugar. I have some black whole peppercorns here and then I have some carrots. We're gonna pickle those. I have some celery hearts I'm gonna cut. I have leftover celery from last week's meal prep, but we're just gonna throw in some fresh kind. And then I have a cucumber here that we're gonna add and then four whole cloves of garlic and that is it you guys you can pretty much do this overnight and it will be pickled the next day this is like a really super quick and easy way to pickle the longer you leave it the better obviously but you could it'll actually hold its pickle flavor because of the juice already simply by waiting 24 hours and you can tell I have my little helper right there and then once all of my veggies were cut and prepped I just loaded them back into the container I poured a little bit out I made sure that all the sugar and everything came out of that initial jar. I added the peppercorns, the garlic, all the veggies, and made sure that the vinegar and stuff was right to the top of the container. I give it, gave it a good shake, and then into the refrigerator it went, you guys, and Jake has been enjoying homemade pickles. So you probably won't see me buying pickles in my grocery hauls too much anymore. All right, now we're on to blue cheese dressing. I've shared this a bunch of times, you guys, but this is a recipe by Dat Keto Lady and is literally the best blue cheese dressing I've ever homemade made ever. And so you just need to put some mayo in a bowl. I will leave the recipe typed up down below because I double it. And so I do two cups, but I believe it's only one. And then you're adding some sour cream, some blue cheese, some Worcestershire. I always can't say that word, but you guys know. And some lemon juice and then some garlic powder. It calls for salt. I never add salt when I add a mayo, so I just put in some black pepper, but that's it, you guys. Worcestershire sauce, lemon, pepper, sour cream, blue cheese, and mayo. That's it. It's like the easiest freaking recipe, and I just load it into a blue ball jar so that we know it's blue cheese, and that's it. We have blue cheese, fresh blue cheese dressing all the time as well, and during football season with wings and veggies, it's key. But you guys, if you have not tried this recipe, check the description box, try it. I promise you, you will love, love, love it. All right, now we're gonna do some boiled eggs in the Instant Pot, and if you guys own any kind of pressure cooker and you have not tried doing your eggs in it, you have not tried anything yet because this is the easiest way to make boiled eggs and you never get them wrong and it's pretty much a set it and forget it kind of thing. So inside of here is a trivet and one cup of water because you always need some water to make your pressure cooker come to pressure. And then I tried to put in as many eggs as I can. I was hoping for a dozen and a half. My trivet did not allow it. I was able to get 14 eggs. That was the most that I could get. I tried jamming in another one, but I didn't want them to crack. So that was the best that I could do. You're going to throw the lid on and you're going to do manual pressure. Now some do the 555 method, which means let it go for five minutes and then let it sit doing a slow pressure release for five minutes and then putting it in a water bath for five minutes. But I found like the 333 method works just as well because I like mine just a tiny bit on the softer side, not a truly like really dry inside yolk. My kids don't like that either. But being that you don't have it on for very long, it doesn't take a lot to have the air come out. So once you check the vent, there should be nothing inside. And I will say that I used to have a Kasori pressure cooker and then I got the Instant Pot. And my favorite thing about it is that you can put the lid on the side because the Kasori wouldn't let you do that. So that was a little annoying. I love having the 
um, lid right there on your disposal just to have a place to put it. So now you're just gonna take your eggs out. They cooked for three minutes. I let them sit for three minutes on that natural release. And now I'm going to take them out and load them in a ice bath for three minutes. And then we're just gonna go ahead and peel them. So. I absolutely love the way that the Instant Pot allows you to peel your eggs. Like the way that it cooks, your eggs are perfect. And out of 14 eggs, you guys, only one stuck one of them otherwise the rest are perfect and when i make deviled eggs i hate when they all break apart and get ugly because they're deviled eggs and you want them to look pretty so of course i had my sidekick with me i'm sure you've seen her in the background already this chick never leaves my side lately in the kitchen i think i'm definitely raising another cook and i love the fact that i've been able to do a lot of school lessons with the kids when it comes to the kitchen i mean it is a science anyways but even down to counting eggs so my accounted all of the eggs for me and then some of them we were going to use for egg salad and some we were just going to keep on hand for hard-boiled eggs so I told her hey we're going to do eight eggs of egg salad and six we're going to keep on hand so she counted all of them and then she had to go ahead and put eight into the bowl and then six we put into another bowl and made egg salad out of but like I said I absolutely love being able to use this as a lesson for her to just continue to learn as she's in the kitchen hanging out with mom so I mentioned to you guys that we were going to keep some for regular hard-boiled eggs and then some for egg salad so this was six eggs but Mason's been killing them during lunch so you'll see in our what's for lunch videos that he has been killing those eggs he absolutely loves them and then we put eight eggs in for some egg salad so we actually ate it that night we did soup and sandwiches and so we ate it that night and this was the container that was left over I do my egg salad super simple you guys literally just mayo and black pepper again no salt because I'm using mayo but I know some people add relish and they get a little crazy with their egg salad but then I feel like it ends up too much like a deviled egg and when it I eat a deviled egg I want to hold it in my hand I like to put this on bread with crackers you guys lettuce tomato and bacon with some egg salad oh my gosh on an everything bagel you guys that is the bomb but that is it you guys for another meal prep video you guys and this like I said was not just epic it was easy and I hope for all of you guys out there that are always intimidated by meal prep you always tell me I don't know how to meal prep it's too much for me that this goes to show you that you can do little bits at a time and it doesn't have to be something super big and extravagant it can just be something that could set you up and make your life easier when you're feeding your family and your kids whether you stay at home or you work anything easier in the kitchen is key so i hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did make sure to give it a big thumbs up if you guys are new here and you made it all the way to the end thank you so much i greatly appreciate that go ahead and hit that subscribe button and tap the bell because like i said it is hard for me to get these meal prep videos out but i do love to do them and I do try and post them randomly about once a month and next time we're going to do a little bit more complicated meal prep so if you guys are in for that make sure you stick around I love you guys all so much thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one bye guys